That's a jackpot if I've ever seen one. What if I told you that you can get stuff like this in just an hour or so of effort and it's not an exploit? Welcome to my video on mining in the Guiding Lands. Hey guys, this is Gaijin Hunter. When I saw videos on YouTube with titles like Make 50,000 Fuel for the Steamworks in One Hour, I scoffed. Surely it was an exploit or bug and not a real game mechanic. Well, it turns out I was wrong. Here's how to get absolutely rich in Iceborne, including precious King Armor Spheres, Celestial Prince, and more. Shout out to both Khan's OA and Aku Chaos as their vids taught me how to do this, but I wanted to try to explain it with my take on it. The Steamworks is a fantastic source of valuable items. During festivals, which we have one upcoming, you can also get these alchemy tickets, which are used at the Elder Melder to make decorations galore. There are two options, normal output, which only costs 10 fuel a pull, or the new 10 times output, which takes 100 fuel per pull, but also pays out better and 10 of each item at a time. Hit a celestial ticket, you'll get 10 of them. Finish the mini game, you'll get 10 king armor spheres. The way that you add fuel is through these special Dragon Vein ores from the Guiding Lands, with the rare Dragon Vein Cold Chunk giving you 500 points apiece. That's enough for 50 pulls of the normal output and 5 pulls for the 10 times output. Farming these items are a lot easier than you could ever imagine. The Guiding Lands has several areas and as you pick up monster tracks and you hunt them, you'll earn points that level that area up. We get that. But on page 2, there is a mining and bone level as well. Each time that you mine a spot to completion, it will raise the gauge. It goes from white to yellow, orange, and then finally red. So basically, you don't really get the good items until it's red. Once you fill up the gauge completely, you'll get a rare item guaranteed, and then the level resets to white again. So you'll want to mine these things to completion until it gets up to the red area. From that point, you just want to stop before you mine it to completion. So if you put on the skill geologist, you'll get four hits with the mining outcrop. So just mine it three times and move on, and your gauge won't move at all, meaning that you'll stay in red and you can run around collecting rare items like candy and maintaining that red rarity the entire time. How mining works. There are four potential mining outcrops each in the forest, coral, rotted, volcanic, and tundra region, and five potential spots in the desert region. At any given time in a single region, two or so of those potential spots are active. So all one has to do is a quick jog through the area, pick up the active spots that are there, and move on. Mining spots spawn and despawn so fast in the Guiding Lands that by the time you go from one region to the next, the mining spots have already reset. So you can just do an endless loop of you going through each area and collecting your riches, rinse and repeat. Sometimes the reset happens so fast that you can grab all four mining spots in a single run through a region. So I repeated my runs until I got a really good one in each region so that I could show you the location of all the ores without any edits. But all you're going to want to do is run through a region, collect the ores that are in your path, then move on to the next area without waiting around for more to respawn. The area will be fresh by the time you return for round 2, and 3, and 4, and 5. The set. All you need to do is craft the Gatherer's Charm, which is easy to make, and use the skill Geologist level 3. That's all you need. As an option, I do use the Stealth Level 3 and Intimidator Level 3 so that I don't get distracted by any of the large monsters. It is worth noting if you can get it because it's limited and I don't have it. Uh, apparently the Assassin's Creed Hood, although it will aggravate monsters around you I think, it does make your running speed much faster, so it makes this sort of, you know, farming method a little bit more efficient if you have it. Again, I don't have it and it's not available right now, but it might be worth picking up next time it's available. First, let's start out with the desert, and I'm going to show sort of how the mechanics work. If you notice on your map, the mining outposts are not shown. That's because they're rare and they're supposed to be found. So if we see here in the desert area, there's nothing. So from the main camp, we're just going to jump down here and go to the left, and that will bring us to the desert area. The Guiding Lands, the forest area, is like stupidly complex, but all the other regions are super simplistic. So don't get sort of overwhelmed like I did at first. It's not so bad. So the first ore that we have that's possible here is up here on the right on the bottom, this discolored area, and indeed we did get it in the first one, so that's good. So we're going to mine this three times. Okay, the second possible place is going to be behind this mound here with the rock. So on the back end of area eight, we'll see if we got this one or not. I know because I did this in post. Ha ha ha. 
and we did. So those are the first two. So at this point, the desert is so large, you could just move on and go to the next area and then come back and do the other spots later, but I'm gonna show you where all of them are at and also how they respawn. So spot number three is all the way down the slidey hill. So go ahead and do the big slide. Woohoo! And it would be right about here, uh, but we didn't proc it because you only get two or so uh, each time. The next one is going to be up these vines and to our immediate left. And again, because we had the other two, this one is not here right now. And the final one in the desert area is across the bridge on the back end. So let's head over. The other areas are not as wide as the desert. So I've seen some people who prefer to just grind without the desert. It would be right here. Um, but I prefer to do all the areas equal. I don't know. I love all my regions equally. Don't ask me which one's my favorite. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and show you what happens if we wait and we loop around and how things respawn. So we're going to go back across this bridge and we're going to go back to the entrance and see if we've gotten them to respawn or not. The other areas, I don't know if it's just the way that the data is treated. Maybe the desert's considered one large area. But the other areas, I notice that things respond faster than the desert for some reason. So if we go here, you notice we have an ore, but is it the same one? You can actually find out by opening up your map. If the mining outcrop is still listed, that means you've already found and you mined it before. So if I did and I mined that on accident, I would progress my gauge and possibly get out of the red and back to white. So you don't want to do that. So let's go ahead and do another sanity check of the other areas. Again, for the desert, I don't even bother to look at the other places. Once I found two ores, I just move on. The next time I come to the desert, I'll just grab them wherever they proc. Here, though, if we wait two minutes, we'll notice that the spots do disappear and they respawn, generally in different areas than where they were. Uh, so if you notice, this one is now magically disappeared. The one behind this mount has disappeared. So let's go down the slippery slope and see if we can find them. Remember, there's only three more possible spots for the two to have procced. It's not here which means it's definitely up this ledge to the left and across the bridge, we're definitely gonna have two mining outposts. And here it is. Let's go ahead and mine that three times. Stonks, man, stonks. <laughs> I know it makes the video longer if I do long cuts like this, but I definitely find when I'm trying to show off areas that it becomes very hard to follow if there's cuts in the middle of the footage. So I hopefully, this helps. Anyways, that shows you how the mechanics work. Now let's go through the runs of all the areas and show you the places of all the other mines. Okay, forest area from the base camp. Just jump down and head to the left. And instead of going straight to the desert, we're gonna turn over to the right hand side and that will bring us to the area with the ores for the forest. There's four different possible areas that it can appear. First one is up here on our left and we can see we've got it over here. Let's go ahead and mine that three times. That fast animation is thanks to the Master Gatherer charm that we created, uh, which is very easy to make. Uh, you can make it in, I think, high rank. Going over here towards the slope, we've got our second point. So far, so lucky. Now we're going to go ahead and head up the slope here. You might see some different routes on YouTube, depending on whether or not the person who's doing the route is also collecting bones or not, but we're just doing ores, uh, so we're going to use this one. There's no one here in the water, which was the third point. So we're gonna skip it for now and go over to the fourth point. I do find for the forest, it makes sense to go check them all out because they generally will respond really fast. I think it's because it considers these different parts, different areas. Uh, so it might just speed up the respawn rate. The forest is also a very good area to start with because in this area, generally you'll have Grimalkins or Palicos. And if you get one of them to join your team, they will actually collect more ores as you go through your run. So definitely make sure to do that. That'll net you some extra materials. So before we work back to camp, let's go over to the water area and see if that last uh, point uh, decided to show up. If it did, we'll mine it. If it didn't, we'll skip it. And there it is. So you see the forest is almost all in one direct path. So it's very, very useful. Once you're done, go ahead and warp back to the main camp and onto the next area. For this one, I'm gonna show you the coral area. I'm gonna show it from the main camp because I don't even have the second camp unlocked and it doesn't matter. Just go under this little under opening there, jump down and head to the left. Now that other camp that you can unlock is this little node right over here on the right hand side, coming up right over there on the right. Um, so you see, we're not saving that much time by unlocking that camp, but if you can unlock it, it'll be a little bit more efficient. 
You can go ahead and pick up the tracks from all these monsters as you're running. Although if you try to pick up a large track, you'll stop and ruin like this. You'll just ruin your time. Uh, you will be gaining a lot of points, which will help you level up your areas. So kill two birds with one stone, right? So the first mining point is down here. Nope, there's nothing there. So we're going to skip it for now. Our next point is to the right of that entrance, just right up here in front of us. Nothing there, so we're just going to keep going forward. And we know because there's only four spots in every area but the desert that we know now where the last two are. One's going to be right here on the right-hand side. And the final one will be right up these vines to the left. Like the forest, this area likes to respawn really fast. Uh, so go ahead and check out those other points before you leave the area, perhaps. Uh, you may be surprised at how fast they might show up. So let's see if they showed up for us this time. So go back down here. Look to the left and we see that other point. It's right there. See how fast that respawns? This is crazy, isn't it? And we'll go ahead and check out that first uh, location and see if we got a spawn there as well. Hey, lo and behold, magic, it appears. <laughs> okay, let's warp back to camp and on to the next. Next up, we're going to the volcano. We're going to start again from this base camp, go underneath this little opening here and jump down just like we did for the coral. And basically what this is, is just a shortcut to the volcano from the other camp. But because I have not unlocked the other camp, I just run from the main one. But if you can do and deliver the materials, go ahead and unlock that second camp. You'll save some time. So just head up to the right here and we're boom that's the second camp and there's a drop down point right here Wee bonk <laughs> and we've got the uh, rotted area to the left and the volcano to the right i like to go to the volcano first first spots here right now on our left it's not there so we'll see if it's there when we come back uh, as we exit just going along the wall here is our second possible place for a mining outpost Then going forward, we have the central rock, and there is a spot on both ends. Here is the first one, so this is spot number three. Then we can circle around, and the other one is on the back end. We'll see if it appears. <laughs> Hello, Aragon. Uh, you can see where the Intimidator and Stealth comes in handy. These monsters don't ever react to me, which is very nice. And here is that fourth spot. Now before we leave, I'm going to go ahead and circle back towards that entrance. Just curious at that first spawn point decided to show up uh, as we leave the area and go over to the rotted one. And lo and behold, it has. So that's good. You can see how fast these things respawn. It's really nice. There are four locations in the rotted area as well. So once we go down the entrance, we're going to head to the left, hug the wall. There should be one right here, but there's not. So we'll go and circle back for that later. Just go up the vines here, up to the upper level. Once you follow the video and you do your own run, you'll get used to this really fast. Okay, mining spot two is right here on our left. We can actually see the third one in the background here. It's along the same wall, uh, just in the back area. So we'll go and do these three times each. Some people recommend that you do not hold down the button to do it because you might accidentally mine it a fourth time. I personally find that I can hold it down and I never really mess up that much, uh, but it really does come down to you. So make sure you do however it's safe because if you overmine it, you could reset the area back down to white and then you just have to level it back up to red again. And here we go. Here is the fourth spot. This is actually to the right side of the entrance. Uh, so you could pick this up when you first enter, but I prefer to do a sort of run around. Let's go back to that very first point and see if it decided to appear. I know it did because I did this in post and there it is. So that shows you the locations of the four spots in the rotted area. Now let's head over to the tundra. We're just going to go through that first opening over here as well. Instead of jumping down that cliff right in front of us, we're just going to head left and go straight up to the Tundra area. You will need to unlock this by doing the special assignment against the Stygian Zenogre called Across the Lost Path. Uh, but if you clear that, it will unlock the Tundra area. So here we go. I'm not a big fan of this area only because it takes longer than the other ones to farm. Uh, you start to lose stamina if you haven't had a hot drink and stuff like that. But it is worth doing uh, nonetheless. So go ahead and jump up here. And our first mining point will be right here. But it's not there. So let's move on forward. We'll come around uh, the second time so I can show it off. Second point's very easy to spot. Some spiky crystals right in the back here. But we don't have them. So let's move on to spot three. Which we know is going to be there because there's only four spots. And there's always two ores at one time. 
And here we go. I am so happy that the other regions of the Guiding Lands are not twisted and long and big like the forest area. Otherwise, this thing would be a real pain to navigate. But as long as you don't focus on the forest, uh, you just do this, you'll be fine. So for the final point, we're just going to head into this cavern here. And it's over here on the right hand side up against the snow crystals. Awesome. So let me go back in this area. This is one like the desert. I noticed that these things don't like to respawn in just one same loop around of the same area. So once you grab two, feel free to just leave. Uh, go back to the forest, rinse and repeat. And the next time you come through, the crystals will most likely be in those two spots that they weren't already. So through the power of editing, we're going back into the tundra area again after two minutes have elapsed. This will reset all the spawn points again. You're just going to be moving on, so it'll be more than two minutes if you're just continuing on your tour. Here's that first spot I was talking about. And we'll notice the second spot right up here. They'll watch for the crystals. Yeah, you can see them poking up already. And there is that second point. So hopefully this gives you a good idea of where all the mining spots are in the entire forest. Now, one bit of advice that I would love to give is that if you're finding that this is a little bit boring to just run around... Uh, and collect ores and I will show a full run uh, in a minute uh, you can just bring stones and if you're like me and you're using stealth and intimidator it's very easy to just start headshotting every monster you run across I don't know if this is by design and it's just a trick or if it's an exploit that they'll fix later but if you have that geologist uh, skill which we're using to get the extra mines what it does is also is if you throw a monster into the wall you'll get to pick up two shinies instead of one so that's fantastic for gaining those very special materials that you get from the guiding lands, which you need to upgrade weapons and stuff. So go ahead and pick up double. What I'll do is I'll just run through and just start headshotting uh, monsters every other run, just if I get bored. <laughs> it's kind of fun, uh, you know, just sort of use stones to win. But anyways, that's one extra thing you could do to make your run a little bit more spicy. Now I'm going to show a full run of me going through, just so you can see sort of how I do my routes and everything and put it all together into one cohesive sort of run through but instead of just having the video up and no talking i did ask you guys some questions on twitter so i'm going to do sort of like an ask me anything and i'm going to pick up some of the questions as you guys ask and answer them as i go through my run so let's jump into that what kind of creature would you like to see inspire a new monster i personally would love to see a cockroach a giant cockroach i can't stand them they're scary it would be a great monster wouldn't it favorite ice cream flavor Chocolate mint baby all the way. Do you feel that restocking items and changing equipment mid hunt was a net positive or negative? I always felt like this was the biggest change in the world for me. It was a really big change and to me personally I actually would rather not have it. Some of my best hunting experiences and memories are those areas where you have to really think about your potion use and if you wasted or you ran out things got really critical or you're on your last card and you're scared and you managed to pull through. That being said, though, I mean, this isn't a game changer for me. So if they decided that that's going to be the new norm, I'll roll with it. Uh, but if I had the choice, I would actually say no to the restocking of items. Since you've tweeted about it at one point, how's your fitness journey going? What have you been working on and achieved health goal wise recently? I'll be honest with you. I talked about it a few weeks ago that I really need to get healthier, count calories, uh, make sure that I'm in a deficit, try to go to the gym, but start slow. I've still been messing it up. I've not been able to get into a routine yet. Uh, I'm still failing, um, but I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep trying and I will figure out where my bad points are and why I'm failing and I will try to address them. So wish me luck, but it's not easy. Do you prefer Capcom to keep updating Iceborne or to make a new Monster Hunter game? Definitely make a new game. I think Iceborne is a great continuation of world. I think it's shown all of the things that it's trying to do. We still have a few more updates to go. I think at that point, the team needs to break off and focus on the next big Monster Hunter game for console. Because that'll definitely take several years to make. I think it's, you know, they've always done this. Like, they do two games for a generation, and then they leave it, and they go on to the next one. And starting new, with a new slate, they're able to do new ideas and new concepts, which I always love. If we do see a new Monster Hunter on Switch, which would you prefer to return? The main series linear weapon trees or generations level up anything system? Personally, I would love to see Generations level up anything system. It created like over 80 different like end game weapons for every single weapon type, which meant that there was no like, okay, make this one weapon and you're done. Like this bow is the strongest one. You'll never need anything else. Make this great sword. You're done. It's the best. So we were able to have so many different variations and permutations of all the different things like high affinity, low affinity, high raw, medium raw, sharpness, like all the different stuff. 
Uh, so it really gave a huge selection of things to do. And because the designs of the weapons were so awesome in the past game, uh, there was plenty of reasons to go and make them just for your collection's sake. So I think for just having longevity, I think a system like what they did with Generations Ultimate, which was new at the time, mind you, would be pretty awesome. That being said, I do want to see the weapon tree, like the UI that they did with World and Iceborne. I want to see that become the new norm because in the past it's been impossible unless you go online to like Wikipedias and sites to actually know what weapon comes from which and that was just way too much to ask for the average player. Are older Monster Hunter games worth playing? Yes, but with some caveats. Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate, absolutely. It's on the Switch right now. It's fantastic. It's a little bit different from the past games. It's a little bit more flashier, a little bit different because it's kind of like an anniversary title. So it's meant to be a little like a spinoff. If you have a 3DS and you don't mind playing on it, Monster for Ultimate is probably hands down the best overall Monster Hunter game ever made. That being said, Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate was fantastic as well and the only series game that has underwater combat, which was really interesting. However, when you go back beyond that, like Monster Hunter Portable 3rd would be totally playable, but they never localized it for the West, so it's not even you're not even able to play it. That was on the PSP. And then when you go back even further, like Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, while that is like the pinnacle of where most veterans came from and was really a golden standard for the series, Going back, it didn't age so well in that the hitboxes for some of the monsters are so cheap and so badly done that I think you'd be more frustrated playing that game than having fun. So, uh, and obviously the first two Monster Hunter games are archaic at this point. The first one in particular having really wonky controls. So I would say yes for the 3DS titles. They're all worth playing if you have a 3DS. Um, and they're interesting. They're just different. So uh, each Monster Hunter game is different and wonderful in its own regard. So Capcom says we can include Prowler in the next Monster Hunter, but one condition you have to choose a weapon to remove from the game. Which would you choose? <laughs> okay, well, I obviously wouldn't choose to exclude any weapon. I think that would be unfair just to include something else. But playing the fun game, what would I choose to remove? Maybe the gun lance because I personally stink at the weapon. And if I want to see some online petitions and riots, it would be kind of funny if they removed the charge blade. What is my preference for the next Monster Hunter World returning monster? Gormagala. I did an online poll on Twitter and I got the same results, but I think Gormagala is highly regarded as probably the most wanted monster to come back outside of Lagiacruz, which can't come back because of technical difficulties. So if they can pull it off, I'd love to see it. How is Ten Ten doing? She's been in a lot of trouble lately and I hope she's okay. Honestly, Ten Ten is my leopard gecko and we've had a lot of roller coasters with her. She had a lot of health problems. We discovered that it was eggs that were twisted and dislodged inside of her. She managed to get them out. Then she got herself stuck in a log and I had to call the fire department to cut open the piece of wood to get her out because she couldn't breathe. But she's doing good. She's healthier than she's ever been in three years since she was born. She's eating well, she's strong, she's happy. And I could not be happier because man, this year has been a roller coaster. Do you think taking a break from Iceborne has led to you enjoying it more now that you've been dipping your toes back in? It's been great having videos popping up again. Yes, uh, there's actually been a lot of reasons why I'm back to Iceborne and I'm playing it. One of them being that, you know, I usually play on my Switch because I commute to work and I'm not often home. When I'm home, I've got to make dinner. I've got to clean the house, check Yuna's homework. I don't have a lot of time and I often play in the room with her. I'll just be on a beanbag plane or I'll be in the bed plane. So playing on a console, I haven't had the time to do it. But with the world situation where it is right now, uh, I'm working remotely from home, which means I get a lot more time with my daughter because remember, I'm a single parent. I get more opportunities to prepare dinner ahead of time and I have more opportunities at home because I'm not commuting. So I've actually had uh, a lot more time that I can play on a console, which has been a very good positive for me. Iceborne, as you all know, was also getting on my nerves. Um, while it does 98% of it, what it does very well and I love it, uh, the two percent was just one of those some like nagging little things that just kept frustrating me and so i think walking away from anything that frustrates you gives you an opportunity to breathe to to reassess your feelings and look at it and say okay like i can accept the certain things i just don't like but overall i really like it so going back to iceborne because of the alatrion update has been really interesting because i'm not a fan of the one hit kill but yet yeah, i love this update i love the monster it was really fun and look at me now, I went on and did Savage Jiva. I'm doing Guiding Lands now. Who knows uh, how long I'm gonna play. So 
I'm enjoying my time with it. If I feel that the party's over, I'll stop playing and I'll just try to keep it all on a good note, which I think is good advice for any game. Okay, and that concludes the run through of how I'm doing the Guiding Lands. I hope you guys enjoyed the Ask Me Anything. Thank you so much for submitting these questions. I didn't get to all of them, so maybe I'll just keep a stock up for the next time I do a similar video. Hope you guys found it interesting. Hope this guide on the Guiding Land helps you out, especially with the festival upcoming. It's going to be a way for someone like myself to make a lot of decorations by using those special tickets from the Steamworks because I just don't have a lot of decorations or I sold them all off because I'm like that. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this video and until next time, happy hunting.